in a 2v2 that he can't win, and he also can't win the 1v1. There was like a lot of problems, I think, with the Echo Fox draft, and uh, you know that's where they felt like most of the issues were in game two. I think that there's certainly something to be said about the play, as, as there was certainly some poor plays there too, but Envy definitely wants to get Lear on a proactive jungler, wants him to be aggressive, and that's the kind of game they played in game two. This is the thing, right? Envy, it's not a tricky for me to figure out exactly why they're winning games. They kind of do one or two things, but they do do them very well. And the fact of the matter is, if you're adding Syndra to the ban list here, now Rek'Sai and Elise are both open, right? So they can actually, oh wow, Elise is going to get banned away, so they don't want that to be first picked. Um, but we could see uh, Rek'Sai grabbed up, but I definitely think we're going to see Rek'Sai grabbed up now uh, that Kalista has actually been taken as a first pick. Uh, you can go for something like Elise in here as well. You can go for those other aggressive junglers if you want it for Lyra. Uh, but that being said, Rek'Sai matches up very well in the 1v1 with Lee Sin, so traditionally that's kind of the side of the matchup you want. Uh, but we've, we've seen that Envy doesn't always care as much about having Lyra on these aggressive junglers as, as a lot of people maybe think they should. Well, I think this is certainly a good start for Envy. Take the Thresh away from the Kalista lane, and give Hakuoi the most contested support globally and one of the best picks right now, and then kind of see where you want to go from there. Maybe you decide to point to Lyra right now because we're happy to take a jungler at a later point. Yeah, but the, the question is, will the jungler actually be there, right? Like, that's why I, I kind of question this. You know, is Talia going to get taken away by Demonte? Like, is it really that much of a contested pick? Uh, I don't personally think so. I don't think it, it's that important, but it depends what your strategy is, right? Lyra can certainly play tanks. Lyra can certainly go for these other styles. So that is not necessarily the problem. Uh, but it's, it's something where he succeeds so often on the aggressive picks. Well, there's Rakan and Rumble. Pretty early for Echo Fox. Rakan makes sense. Pairs nicely with the Kalista, like you used to see on the old Alistar lanes, etc. And you've kind of now put them in a situation where it's like, well, do you want to try to counterpick uh, the top lane right now before they can ban out some of the answers? Or do you want to go for your jungler? And they do end up getting the Rex Eye. So I uh, picked up a little bit later than I thought, but still in the first round. And now uh, we could see Echo Fox probably throwing their bans towards the top side. There is theoretically a chance it could be Rumble Jungle, as we have seen that from time to time. Very rarely, though, in the NALCS. Uh, but I am expecting it to go top, and Echo Fox probably should ban out some of the matchups that can be problematic for him. But we have seen things like Kled work exceptionally well against Rumble, especially in combination with an early aggressive jungler. If you get that ahead, it can be pretty ugly. Uh, Camille and things like this can sometimes work very well also. But it's not something where you sit pa passively, otherwise Rumble will bully you. You have to be aggressive. and. That's why having Rek'Sai is so important. All right, so a Tristana ban actually for Echo Fox. Cassidy was actually the first ban for Envy. So mm -hmm. protecting their bot lane as Envy try and cover this mid is pretty interesting here. Yeah, it makes, makes sense to try to actually defend that Talia pick. Assassins can be very difficult uh, for her to deal with. And, and if you want to take a split push threat uh, to actually deal with the rumble, if that's the option that they're going to go for, then banning out you know a split pusher in the mid lane, a split pusher on the top lane, these sorts of things. Um, can make sense, although you know the NAR ban means that Envy thinks there's a chance that this is not actually a top lane rumble, right? Like they're saying, hey, that could be rumble jungle or perhaps even rumble mid, which would be super bizarre. Uh, so Echo Fox must at least have shown some reason that, that that Greg has been playing this or something. Otherwise, you don't ban out a top lane. Yep, and there's the side ban there for Echo Fox, so just take out two ADs. Apollo going to get pushed down maybe to Ash, Ash though. I mean, Ash is still available. Like, he's been loving to play this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, he's kind of laughing. It, it's it's one of those things where did they really punish him <laughs> if, if he's actually you know playing on that Ash? I, I don't really think that this is accomplishing that much, although Ash is maybe a bit less safe, uh, you could say, certainly than something like the Dristana or, or the Zaya who has kind of this defensive ultimate, but you don't have to play as aggressively because you have the utility of the Hawkshot and you have the utility of the engage, and we saw how effective uh, he was able to actually be on it. Well, it feels like there's something up in this draft. That's Olaf, so that now looks like more of the jungle pick, so yeah. maybe, maybe wasting that Narba in here. But I think if you're picking this way, I was going to say you might need an AD in here, but they actually go with Ori instead. And, and the, the fair thing to actually say is that this could have still been a Rumble jungle, uh, you know, when they picked Lunar, right? But you're saying, okay, well, now we can't have the premier top lane pick, so we'll just put it in top lane, and, and as long as you're willing to actually flex back and forth, it can be a fine ban from Envy. Uh, but this this can be one of the advantages of having this kind of crazy roster from Echo Fox. You say, well, no one gets to scrim against them, so now you're kind of, well, could, could it be jungle Rumble? Maybe, maybe not. I guess we'll pay that respect to them. Well, Galio actually lost pick for top lane. Feels a little rough huh. for Seraph, but he kind of ran out of options, I guess. 
Uh, I mean, I, job think, I, think it's, I think it's fine. I actually think yeah, it, it's okay. going to work pretty well in this situation, uh, simply because Galio loves to itemize MR and it's it double solo laners with uh, AP threat, right? Like this is a Rumble and an Orianna. Yes, there is an Olaf to provide some physical damage to actually threaten him there, but uh, he can itemize very easily into things like the Adaptive Helm and Servicage and so on and so forth, and uh, will become pretty resilient there. And if Rumble's just going to push him in, he can farm it out. He can kind of equalize in that way. Uh, the one thing I would say is, Galio like doesn't really have a lot of great ways in. I mean. Rek'Sai tunnels in, sure, great, but that's, it's not like it's an Olaf flying in, it's not like it's a J4, it's not, you know, any of these super crazy hardcore uh, aggression type champions that can dive in and set up the Galio ultimate, so I don't really love the combo there. And my other concern for MB's lineup is, do they have like enough physical DPS in there? You know, the Ash is not always uh, the highest DPS champion, and there is gonna be a lot of threat on an Ash from an Olaf and an Equalizer and, you know, all of, all of the CC and stuff that can come out, so can he actually put out enough damage to force them to build armor, or will they be able to just be kind of too efficient with their itemization and just build them armor? Yeah, it's kind of a more middle of the road combo, it feels like, for Envy's. A lot of aggression in game two. Game one was kind of a very different combo. I mean, Agapox has played very clean, so it was tough to say exactly compositionally what happened to Envy. Here in this game, I feel like they're giving them a few more team fighting options, but still built in a lot of good pick as well. So, see how it works out here in game number three, but Fox with another somewhat oddball draft, I guess, yeah. honestly. I honestly don't really love either draft. Yeah, I'm feeling that. Yeah, I think I, I think they're 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 fine. The compositions obviously can work. Uh, somebody has to win, so you know that's gonna happen. <laughs> but um, <laughs> one of these drafts is correct. Yeah, well, they're at least way. correct enough. But um, <laughs> correct enough to win. Yeah, uh, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I, I mean, I just I just think it's it's one of those situations where uh, you know it's, it's it is kind of middle of the road, like you said, but. Uh, drafting, drafting yourself into a situation where it's not a Caitlyn is like the only physical damage stride, it's an Ash, and, and it obviously can work, and it, it's probably going to come down more to lanes and things like this, but I, I don't really love either comp. Yeah, it can be tough. As Apollo gets 10 gold. He's officially ahead in CS in his lane, so good he's looking him. good after that ward kill. Looks like some level one was being thought about maybe by Fox, but it looks like we're all across the rift. Just uh, getting some vision. Looper might try and pop in for a ward, but no, even he's just going to move back in hang out here in this Minions brush getting vision. Looper is going to have to be pretty damn careful, I think, in this lane, uh, simply because the amount of gank assist that Seraph actually provides is, is pretty nuts. Um, and, and, and the fact that you want to be pushing in as the rumble and actually shoving in those mini waves over and over and over and over uh, means that you're exposing yourself to those ganks, right? If Rek'Sai comes up early uh, and you have Seraph able to land a taunt and able to hit you with that CC, it can be very tough. Uh, Envy going for the invade and uh, going to take away a little bit of this small camp, but Echo Fox just kind of straight up move over and start leashing the red. So it's not going to be that big of a deal for Greg. Mm -hmm. Greg going to lose a couple things here, but we'll be slowed down slightly later with no help, but pretty able to get pretty quickly through the jungle as looks like yeah. two little raptors were taken away from Greg. And, and Olaf can clear this super easy, so it's actually not really going to matter. Uh, I think that's a pretty smart adaptation from Echo Fox to so back up. They don't really lose that much, and I think it's a nice little start for them. Yep, Michael with a good play, though. Picks up a soul and then slaps Keith after flying him back in. Nisky already level two, pressuring Demonte a little bit. And he got level two earlier because he picked up those little raptor kills. Uh, so that's a bit of an edge there for him. Seraph actually shoving in the top side as well. Uh, it's not as easy for Rumble to have the auto push because you can't really overheat level one uh, with some of the patches that came out for Rumble a couple patches ago. Uh, it's harder for him to actually build up that heat. And essentially your flame splitter does more damage, but it's a lower cooldown and wow, Gate should not be standing up there uh, when they're level two. That was the anti-mind game hook they have a Hakua. You always like <laughs> want to try and think they're going to predict the juke, so you just stay there. Hakua was like, no, I'm just throwing this one straight at your face. A lot of damage they dealt out. So potions are forcing to be used there as uh, chilling back out in the top side. Looks like Loop has got the way pushing back out in the right direction, but Seraph looking fine just now. Lyra, we check back in with the junglers though. Full clearing one side. Looks like Grig's doing the same. So it does feel like again, Grig kind of defaulting a little more to more farm heavy styles, at least in the early stages of the game. But Apollo with another good hawk shot and the oh, no wards actually. I thought Niski was going over to do so, but. Pops it down in a different spot on the left because looks like they spotted Greg on the right. Yeah, so both junglers going for pretty much a power clear. 
Uh, Lyra already heading back to base. Uh, it did pick up a scuttle on the bot side, drop the ward, so trying to give some protection over. Uh, they also know where Grig was on the bot side of the map, so uh, MB just going to back up after actually pushing in the wave, and I think this is pretty smart play. Uh, Lyra will be faster back out on the map and now can head top side. Uh, where that is going to be a big point of contention, you know. Uh, Looper is going to be pushing in. Yeah, sure, he has, has a Trinket Ward, but he kind of has to guess where the jungler is going to be coming from, and he's placed that far out on the river. But this means if Lyra comes straight through Tribrush, he has no warning at all. It's hard, though, as a top laner, because you only have so many wards in the early game. Well, Lyra is on the Krugs and ready to do exactly that into the top lane. Double buffs ready, level 4 for the Rek'Sai right nice and quickly. And you can see how much respect uh, Looper is actually giving to that, kind of starting to stand back, but fight's breaking out in the bot lane. And Oh yeah, see, this is the path he's actually looking for. This is this is pretty smart. Like, this is the kind of the mind game is, uh, you would expect that the top laner would actually ward in the tri brush. So you use the blast cone, you come over the, over the Baron pit, and you actually go in through there. But that's exactly where the ward is, so. Uh, pretty smart stuff, I'd say, from Looper. Yeah, you can see Lyra did off the spot Krug, so more information to give him. But now Olaf going to move in to try and contest for a camp as Lyra smited the scuttle crab. And Grig can do this because of the ski base. So that's kind of the unseen uh, reasoning behind this. Normally that would not be an invade he could do at all, but Lyra cannot really heavily contest uh, because of the fact that Demonte had the push. He was actually in lane, and I, I believe that Lyra actually smited the scuttle, and Grig would have seen that, so that's another reason. So it's these little things that kind of go into the decision making. Knowing Smite's down, knowing the mid laner cannot support, allows Grig to take away that camp, and that's just smart play. Looks like Triple Doran still with Seraph despite the changes, so feeling like he does need some early lane power. Still fine, of course, but not as efficient. Yeah, I mean, it, he's going for it for the AP to try to hit a damage threshold where you can actually one shot the backline with your Q. Um, but I still think it's pretty bad. I, I think that. You know, generally people's answer to this has been uh, kind of going like triple early game items. Like you go Dorant Ring, Dark Seal, Corrupted, right? It, that that kind of gives you similar levels of early game power uh, because you lose the passive on these and it's, in my opinion, not really worth it uh, build-wise anymore. Well, so Sarah's got some vision down and goes back to the lane. So we'll see just what he can do with all his extra rings. Certainly is uh, one of the big reasons top lane Galio in particular has not been nearly as popular. We're going to trade back and forth. Already level 6 for Seraph. Doesn't give him any combat power really, but some, uh, that's a level advantage. Helps him out raw stats wise. Looping on digging 6 though. I feel much more complete now that he has every ability at his disposal. Yeah, and kind Seraph. of as expected. Nothing's happening in top lane. <laughs> yeah, nothing, nothing too much. Galio really does kind of excel at, at short trades, and that's what Seraph is kind of going to be looking for. It's like you want to utilize your three abilities, you hit them with the E, and then you taunt them, and that guarantees your Q or whatever. So you're essentially doing this rotation. Uh, but then after that, the longer the trade goes, the worse it gets for you because your cooldowns actually are relatively long before you have built up the CDR and have enough levels. Uh, so it's about those short trades, and that's what Seraph is kind of trying to utilize uh, to get that push. And Looper also. Uh, is kind of allowing the push to be given up more uh, because he knows how scared he has to be of the Rek'Sai. Uh, yes, Rek'Sai has been spotted out on the bot side now, but you need to play with respect to the jungle. Hook gonna miss there. Not quite able to grab Gate. As Lyra is actually invading, so Envy trying to play aggressive in there 2v2. Only level 5 here on both sides, so probably gonna keep him at arm's length. A lot of fighting around this, this red buff, though. We'll see if Lyra can actually smite it away. Would be risky to go for. Nice ball positioning there from Demonte, kind of in between Lyra and the red buff. So if Lyra came forward, you can hit him with a shockwave. Uh, and being able to get that over on Grig, pretty important because he's already down a level. And, you know, giving over that experience and the power of that red buff uh, to Lyra when he's already ahead uh, would have been somewhat problematic. Yep, Lyra recognizing this, just plays it safe and goes for a Prey Seeker, hoping Grig mismites. He does not. And then we can kill that buff for himself. Good knockback there from Niski under Demonte. Big bit of pressure there from Talia. Yeah, both sides playing it pretty passive so far, though. No real attempts at ganks happening uh, just yet. I, I do think they could look top lane, but nice hook. CC chain. Oh, great sick, play. Though. Plays nice, but so safe there for Gate. Yeah, Gate has the, the double dash to be able to actually, actually get out. So uh, the grand entrance does get played, but he's able to hop right back to Key. So very well done from him. Yeah. Need to burn any cooldowns really there. I'm just continuing farming things out. Looks like it's back time for Apollo and Hakoi though. BF Sword boots done. And that's been complete now for Hakoi as well. So, early landing items. Done it nice and early here. 
Yeah. It's been a nice even farm fest in the bot side. In fact, this game is easily the closest of the three we've had, which is pretty common in a best of three. Just a lot of early farming and feeling out for both. Ooh, Galio's in range of ultimate, so they could commit for a fight here. We'll see if they want to try to go for this. Don't want to go over the ball, but the blue buff resets, so job half done for MV. Yeah, they're just going to go back to mid lane and push now. I guess they're giving up on it. Uh, it does look like as, as Nissi is over there. Hako is also here though. So the taunt landing onto Looper could start something up, but Lyra and Stegan will take the Stutter Crab and yeah. flew over to Demonte. Despite the vision there for Envy, don't feel confident going in for that invade. Yeah, so Nissi kind of gets the, the smaller win, which is just pushing in the minions, maybe deny a couple of those uh, from his opponent. So it's not bad. Uh, not going to be a big difference by any means, but you know, it's, it's something, right? It's, Looper actually feeling a little bit nervous, it seems. Uh, wants to drop down that equalizer. He wants to base. Uh, Going to be able to clear out that wave and, and head back home. Uh, not having to utilize you know, TPs and that on cooldown, you want to be making sure you're not getting pushed in at that time. Well, looks like Seraph's going to do the same. Why not? Might as well when the window is open to back. Blue buff now over to Nierski, so the steal not going right for them. Doesn't mean he won't get one. And uh, we'll continue just seeing again farm back and forth. But we did see this from Demonte in the first game here. I mean, you don't always have to leave your lane early as Talia and go roaming, but if it's possible, Niski would like to try and get the snowball going. That first arrow play not quite working out for Envy, but yeah. we'll see if they can accelerate the game a little more, because that is how they got ahead in game two. And I mean, the, the, making the arrow play work on the bot side is pretty tough. Now that Keith is actually level six on the Callista, as long as Gate stands in front of him, you can just Callista all of them out of that, no problem. And even if you manage to hit Gate, Gate can, or sorry, even if you manage to hit Keith, Gate can probably peel for him, right? You know, utilizing his ultimate, and we'll see if a fight's gonna break out here. There are four members of Envy. Uh, they're faster on the play. I don't think that Box is going to try. Yeah, this is nice from Envy just again forcing themselves onto the Drake. Drake was not quite in position and hard for Olive to do anything and get over a walk because he has to go to him. Yeah, and, and the biggest part of that is once again, mid lane priority. Demonte, you know, not there yet. Uh, Niski shoves in the wave, then goes to Dragon. Demonte must answer that wave or lose CS and turret damage. And uh, that gives them an easy mountain Drake. So again, Envy kind of playing the map smartly here, knowing that picks aren't forthcoming just yet. So might as well just take a different objective and kind of keep the game moving forward in their favor. No gold, of course, comes out of that Drake, but they can start slapping the turrets. Or the Baron, or the next Drake, depending <laughs> on what comes up next. This pace of play has been significantly slower in this game. And like our folks were definitely more happy in game one to play a more conservative early game and then really open up. And once they got a lead, they never let go of it. Yeah, they really didn't. And, and I mean, it's, it's also that it's a game three, right? You don't have any more games to give. They really want to get the wins in this series for both teams. Uh, Envy on the rise, tied for fourth right now, looking to climb in the standings even more. You know, try to hopefully get up to that playoff spot. And Equifox looking to climb into contention for sixth place. You know, the gap is still small enough that they have a chance uh, kind of squeezing into one of those bottom playoff spots. Well, looks like a play being set up here by Echo Fox. Going to move for Khan and Olaf just up to the right hand side of mid lane. Blue buff. It's spawning just yet, but vision down. Regardless, for Fox is nice. They have a triplet of wards actually just above that side of the buff. They do indeed, fighting for that vision. Uh, it looks like MV may want to try to make a move uh, towards the Rift Herald, and they are going to be able to take that down. So, Alira grabbing something, and this, this could actually cause some tension in the game as far as do you want to try to drop this and actually force a play? I mean, if you can dive the Rumble right now, like that, or, or get a kill, or push him out, or anything like that, you can drop the Rift Herald and try to go for first turret. Uh, that makes that Rift Herald even that much more valuable. Uh, they may be expecting that this is going to happen on top side, though, so. Echo Fox is already preempting this. They're sending their bot lane top. Uh, we'll see if Envy is going to get wind of that and try to match. It uh, looks like for now, though, they're actually setting up for a, an arrow on mid lane. Apollo was on point with these uh, in game number one, and, or sorry, rather game number two, and yesterday. So we'll see if he can actually land. Nope, no arrow forth coming. Hakuo roaming up, but I think he's just having to clear vision as Fox do have enough surveillance to spot out that play from Apollo. Certainly was a nice thought here, but that lane swap could give a lot of tempo over to Fox, but actually bottom side's where they're going to go. Turret. Looking for that first turret, Rift Child's going to make it pretty simple. Yeah, that's pretty much a guaranteed first turret. Nicely done for them there. And uh, while they will have to give up the first turret uh, on the top side, Galio can certainly start to thin the wave out with his Qs, and uh, they won't be able to actually go for a second turret, whereas Envy's already getting up to there. We'll have to see the Equalizer come out, and it does get some damage down, but that 
brings off the back door, having that Rift Herald there, so they actually are probably going to get the second turret as well. Yep, she'll be able to, and the first turret just finishes their Fox. So really nice play there for Ambi and Fox, not fast enough for that tier two. And a big cash in, honestly, from the Rift Herald there. So uh, they're looking to try to pilfer some of the jungle on the top side, take some of that away, but uh, Seraph very easily will defend the tier two turret top. And now Echo Fox looking to try to maybe move over towards mid lane and see if there's anything there, but Niski's already uh, kind of evacuated the area. Looks like everyone's got gold to spend. The Apollo goes back. Essence Raven components already there, so not too far away from the item completion. Duante also going back. I saw choose now to join in with his Morello Nomicon. And Niski Morello's first became as well with Blade finish for Keats. So a lot of item pickups there. Some gold gets exchanged, but Envy do end up on top in the total trade. A thousand gold ahead now. Two turrets to one, taking those two out in the bot lane. And a lot of thanks. That just goes to the Rift Herald. So uh, well done by Lyric to be able to actually set up a nice Rift Herald play. Uh, the lane swap ends up kind of backfiring on Echo Fox a bit because they want to try to preempt the play, look for maybe that first turret top side. But Rift Herald really throws the map on that out of whack. So not much they can actually do to fight back and, and get an even trade there once they put themselves into that situation. But we're pretty deep into the game. Niski has his rank two ultimate. Still have yet to actually get active with that, but Envy is playing pretty passively. And this is a very different Envy. You know, we talked a little bit about Echo Fox, uh, you know, kind of some of their past and how they have had some really strong moments, but never really that consistency. And for Envy, they're coming in as really like probably the worst team last split, right? Like they, they were definitely one of the lower tier teams. Now they are like a legitimate threat as a playoff team. And they have really shifted their focus. Like a game like this does show that. Oh, that was really close. Great flash from Demonte gets out from under another well-aimed arrow. Almost takes out the other solo laner. Flash down, though. They could try to force onto Demonte, but looking like we'll be passive again. And you know, Envy used to be all about the early game. It was like, Lyra, if you don't have six kills by five minutes, we probably lose. And now, I mean, they're willing to sit back. They're willing to play these passive games. They're showing a different dimension to the team. Well, I think... Given what we've seen in this series so far, this pace of play certainly suits Fox, but we'll be impressive to see if Envy can play a more controlled game. Uh, fun fact, though, we are going to break uh, a different kind of record today. Today will be the slowest first blood of the split. In this game? Yep. Oh, wow, there you go. We I mean, did it. We did it. I mean, still sitting with a ill 0 0. I mean, lots of objectives kind of been. Looked at here and there. I think Envy have got the better end of all of those trades. They got that Fred Mountain. They took the two turrets. It seems like they've recognized that picks aren't as easy, so they'll happy to I'll play the map instead. But Fox are just biding their time. And really hard oh, and now we're going to see some action. I think uh, this is going to be almost impossible for Looper to get out of. Three man dive. Looper flashes, but is already exhausted. Leo here as well. Knocked back from Niski with the W. And there's first blood Apollo. Gonna get it. Yeah, Looper with a nice try. He'd already actually ulted out the minion wave, but then didn't have it to actually fight off the dive. And when there's that many members there, you don't even need the minions. So first blood finally cashed in there from Envy. Another Fox arrow from Apollo is looking for Demonte. Seraph not able to line it up, but Demonte still taunted up. The team coming in. The ball's gonna zone off the rest of them. Gate there able to protect him. Knocks up Seraph as the Drake does go over to Olaf. Envy still maybe trying to fight, but not much to force right now. Yeah, well. I think Apollo shouldn't be basing. He could just actually stay on the top side. They know that Rumble is dead, and, and bot side, that's where everyone else is. So Apollo could have actually been going uh, to try to get some turret damage, but instead he will go back to base. Niski at least getting some pressure on the mid lane. Uh, gonna be able to chunk that out, but here's the dive again. So Looper knows that this is coming. Uh, he actually just drops the ultimate very early and he wants to try to back off, but if you've already utilized that ultimate and they are behind you, there's no real way out. So Aquo just gonna tank this up. Stands on the very outside, takes as many turret shots as he can, and there's just nowhere really to go for Looper, even though he did a pretty good job avoiding the CC. Yep. Simple stuff there for Envy. But do you have to lose the, the second potential mountain break for them as a result? Red Buff Invader is currently in progress. And that'll be successful. No vision there in the brush for Greg, so Envy will just that one down. And this is applying a good amount of pressure. Game definitely starting to open back up as the Monty gets shoved back into the rocks. Aqua not quite able to combo that, but no flash, no heal now for the Orianna, and his turret is low. Dante is an easy target for Envy. Yeah, he really is. Uh, I actually kind of like this, this build adaptation here from Lyra too, going Knight's Vow second. You know, I kind of talked about, hey, is there actually enough physical DPS in, in the kit with just kind of this Apollo Ash? You know, Rek'Sai generally not going to add a ton of team fight damage, especially not as this tank, but 
uh, he's going to be able to kind of give more safety to Apollo. And if you can make sure Apollo can survive and he's not actually as threatened by the Olaf and the Rumble and stuff like I talked about, then yeah, he is going to add enough physical damage. So a uh, pretty defensive itemization, but it's it's something that keeps his carry alive and allows him to perhaps get that extra damage out that they'll need. Yeah, Apollo is still shoving in the lane. Might try and take him here, but going to meet some resistance as Keith and Gay return. Again, seals in the uh, inventories of both bot laners, actually. Using towards that second major item. But Envy, I think, starting to get a little more proactive around the map. You can see they've opened up a couple turrets. They're just sweeping up vision. I think starting to realize that, you know what, we, we can play a bit more aggressive in this game and mm -hmm. look for opportunities. And there's one under gate. Oh, great shot back in. But uh, Glistrol is still there, so very patient from Envy just to wait. Not overcommit cooldowns. Yeah, pretty comfortable knowing that they have that Kalista ultimate in the back pocket. So if any major cooldown got committed, like the Ash ult or something, uh, you certainly would have seen Keith pop that and get his support out of there. Some damage though, and Niski's actually now splitting the side lane. So a really safe lane for Apollo to farm in the mid lane here. Although, you need to get back as Fox are actually counterattacking there. Threatening this turret. MB could try to collapse on this though. If Galio actually comes up, they have the Weaver's Wall available. They have Ash Arrow here too, but I can Fox push it in, back off, and nothing happening. Yeah, could maybe cut them off here, but I don't think Niski can see enough for a wall angle. Do want that mid turret, but Envy again going to continue playing patient as Gate on top of a control ward while recalling. Yeah, both teams just kind of scaling oh, kind of up. I mean, neither solo laner from Envy has actually expended an ultimate yet this game, uh, I do believe. At level 13 on both of those guys, they are they're getting to a pretty strong point. I think that Rumble and Orianna, it's going to be a pretty powerful team fight from then, but it's, it's going to be so much it feels like about the initial moments of the fight for this Echo Fox squad. You know, can you actually get a really good combo down? You know, if Gate can actually get a stun, you know, get that engage onto Apollo or onto Niski, and then you can follow that up with the Rumble ultimate with the Orianna ultimate, then they can certainly win the fight because the amount of front-loaded burst and damage that's going to come out from the Soul Laner's ultimate will be massive. But if you cannot make that happen, I think it's pretty tough for Keith to actually fight through the Rek'Sai and the Galio and the Thresh because he's you know, relatively low range. And this is an AD carry that has to kind of get up in their opponent's face and that's very tough to do against all this CC because if you step forward and get actually locked up, uh, then the Kliss is very likely to nail it down. Well, Envy maybe going to prompt themselves into a team fight with Apollo finishing his second item. Hurricane now up. Ready to go, and you can see a gold lead actually pretty big there. Mm -hmm. 3,000 gold up for Envy. I mean, might even get more. No, Demonte so it's out of the way of the arrow, but that's kind of a very passive lead that's been developed here. I mean, Fox can get it back easily if they win a fight, but they keep playing back. They're just going to slowly maybe lose, but here's the action. Apollo going to get left on, but actually a double oh, shot. Up, so trying to get out of the shockwave land through. Demonte needs to get back into the rest of the fight. Harkalo is low, but Keith is going to be able to take him down as Niski zones out Orianna. Seraph low. Didn't even commit the ultimate just yet. Fox trying to fight their way out here, but Lyra back in with the ultimate. Executes Demonte, and there's the Galio just to save Lyra. And Echo Fox is on the wrong side of the map. Here they are pinned down. We'll see if they can oh, fight out. Apollo burnt down by Looper. Very nice. But now they're going to keep going for the re engage. Niski with a lot of damage, but Olaf able to take down the Galio. Lyra gets out of there. Smites the Baron for a bit of extra health, and Niski just can't quite seal those last few kills. Yeah, Niski and Lyra so low. It ends up being that uh, two for three trade there. So it goes slightly in the favor of Echo Fox, and they are pushing in. So not a bad fight there. Uh, and critically, they got summoners off of both Apollo and Niski. So if they can actually look for that one more time within the next five minutes, that could be very big for them. Because had that Shockwave hit on Apollo, it would have been a devastatingly one-sided fight, I think, for Echo Fox. But Apollo had a quick flash, got out of the Shockwave, and they weren't fully synced up. So you'll see the engage coming in. There it is. But the ball was not actually already on gate. Uh, so Apollo had time to actually flash out before the Shockwave could land. But they have gotten the summoners off both carries. And Echo Fox need to now try to make that play one more time before the flash comes back up. Well, kind of a fun ending to this fight. But Luke is doing a really good job actually cleaning up a couple kills and keeping the rest of his team safe. Yeah, very, very scrappy fight. And as the health bars got lower and lower, it became very difficult for uh, the people to actually fully commit and enter the fight. So uh, pretty evenly matched on both sides. He's doing a lot of work though in that fight. It was a long one, so it's really able to output tons and tons of burst. I guess not burst, really. It's the same damage. Ocean Drake is going to add to the stockpile there as well for Envy. I'll grab the second Drake ahead in that objective right now. 
But of course, we've gotten so late steadily into this game that Pin and up Speedy Baron, there's another there. one. I mean, they did just clear out the ward and they know the jungler's there. This is pretty easy to predict. Echo Fox may try to turn for the fight, though. Ultimates are back up, and remember, no flashes on the carries. Echo Fox looking for the fight. Faith Call burnt on the Harkaway, but he gets moved back in. The Charm is there, but the Dark Up's actually not going to quite hit anyone. Seraph tanks all of the CC in the front line, and Lyra just going to tunnel out of the way. Yeah, Gate actually couldn't get through to the carries, used the CC combo onto Seraph, and then there's nothing really else to get done there. And that's every ultimate except for Nemante's down from Echo Fox. So now I feel like Envy can very easily start up the Baron and say, come fight us. Like, there's no power really left in Echo Fox without those playmaking abilities. We get to cancel that recall, but Envy will not be starting the Baron. No. Still some good wards around the area. I mean, want to play a pretty passive, which, which has been kind of the story of this game. So that I understand that they want to kind of keep uh, playing it safe. But I, but I do feel like you need the ultimate so much less uh, on the side of Envy than you do it like the Equalizer and you know and Ragnarok and all these big, big engage abilities and powerful team fight abilities. Well, it looks like top turret's gonna go down, so Envy actually extending their gold lead to 4,000. Now Gate dances out of the way. Envy keep defending their turrets. Fox only has one, and it was the trade that initially made in that lane swap when he traded two for one for taking out the top outer. So Fox again is just kind of backed into a corner. And it's so tough in these spots when the game gets late to like to do anything because you don't have map. Well, and, and kind of, to be honest, feels like they let themselves get to this point. I mean, when was their first real attempt at an engage? Like post 20 minutes in the game, right? Uh, so it's, it's one of those situations where this was kind of some of the criticisms uh, that used to be leveled at Echo Fox is that it's like, well, they just kind of sit around. They, if they don't get a big early game lead, what are they really going to do? This game has been played very passively. Uh, Envy played the map better, got farm advantages, took more turrets. So now they do have the edge. Echo Fox certainly has the playmaking. Uh, to make something happen, but uh, they need to be able to execute on that as flashes are soon going to be back up for Apollo and Niski. So the window is still there, but it is closing, and we'll see if Echo Fox can actually force a fight before they are back up. Seraphon is level 16 as well. Nothing one to point out for ultimate range. He's bottom lane right now, but with no TP, so just gets a little push going and in a room back up to make sure he can cover for a potential team fight, but that's a wave now that Fox have to answer, and they are very good at this 4-1 style. Seraph likes a lot of these champions, even though you know the likes of Shen and Galio aren't that meta, they are good with them. Certainly the case, and now it's just kind of the fight for mid lane priority. Echo Fox pushes up mid lane, goes to Baron, tries to ward that out, and then Envy responds in Kai. They get control of mid lane, then they get to go over the Baron, clearing out this vision, uh, being able to kind of reestablish that control uh, for their team is Pretty important. Very simple for Envy to get it because they've got a mid out of Tar and a Talia. So uh, just going to camp this brush and hope Fox walks the wrong way, loop it down to the bot side, but with his teleport, so can join if needed. But Envy have taken control back over the area with all their vision down. And Envy have lived through this scary time where the, the summoners were not on their carries, right? Like that was kind of the big window you feel like for Echo Fox because yes, they could make the engage work, but if Apollo and Niski utilize their summoner cooldowns very, very well, uh, they can probably avoid you know the equalizer and the shockwave reasonably well and survive. Uh, so Echo Fox kind of has to force a fight, force out the summoners, and then repeat again. You know, in, unless they really can catch them with like a perfect combo. If you can get Gate and Shockwave as he's going in and CCs them, then maybe you don't actually need to force those cooldowns. Well, Luke's gonna get a turret. Envy waiting around for a fight, but maybe now they've found one. It's onto Grig though, just pops the Ragnarok and walks away. Ragnarok, big cooldown though. It's very tough uh, for Grig to be effective in these team fights when that is down. And uh, Looper continuing to push. They're trying to get a side lane advantage, trying to have him kind of farm that out and pressure some of these turrets. Uh, but Seraph is going over to respond. Yeah, no, actually Fox under the mid lane turret, but that could prompt Envy into another fight here. Seraph is running him away, but Niski's actually going to gank the bot side instead. Looper does have his flash, but might have to burn it pretty soon to get out of the way. The blast gun is there for safety, going to try and make it over the wall, but he is going to get it. Oh, Niski, he tried to predict it. Look good, but he flashes over just to seal it. Yeah, uh, Looper flashed in place there as well. Looks like his mouse was misplaced. I think the way he gets out in that situation, you have to flash the blast cone and then knock yourself out to essentially get uh, maximum distance. It seemed like a bit of a panic flash. Maybe was not expecting Niski to really follow. He never dropped the equalizer. He never really utilized his flash well at all. Uh, that felt like maybe one he should have been able to get out of. And one of the nice things about all the pressure that Envy have, you've mentioned it 
earlier. We'll just watch this play again, but yeah. It was, it was a good initial play from Looper there. Uh, Sarah, for whatever reason, I, I don't know if he's actually just not used to playing Galio. He keeps instant tapping his taunt. He's not actually channeling, and I don't know if he doesn't realize or if he's just not comfortable, but he's not getting a full taunt there, and then watch the flash. Like, pretty much flashes in place. Um, but yeah, so it was a good sidestep on, on the actual Justice Punch. Seraph, for whatever reason, does not channel his taunt, so it's like a 0.1 second taunt. It doesn't actually do anything, and, and that gave Looper a chance to get away. Uh, but not utilizing the flash, kind of waffling on if he should flash over the wall or use the blast cone. Didn't use the equalizer to peel for himself, so definitely some mistakes. That's Gate gonna get knocked back into the team, but Close Throat will pull him out to safety. Fight maybe still starters are onto Grig, but he's pretty tanky, so with just Lyra there not taking too much punishment. I mean, Envy are happy to use their kind of double global kill with the Galio with the Talia to just punish wherever they're going, because Fox have so little room that even though Loop is doing the right thing in that lane, but he can't really do so safely if Envy choose to gank the lane with their mid laner, so. At least if, if they don't have vision, which they did not. I mean, look how dark the map is. They have a uh, pink ward in mid lane and pink lane is uh, in the side brush. Like, for all they know, their opponents aren't barren, and that's why they drop uh, their blue trinket there from Keith. They have to check on it. If you don't have side lane control, like with the wards in this blue side jungle, it's so hard for Looper to safely push, and especially without his flash. And today's split pusher is Apollo as he peeks down briefly into the top lane to hit the lane shoving. Wall gonna try and hit nice Keith, but Keith. he humps just over and gets knocked back on the right side. And that blue ward's still there, but it doesn't actually grant vision, so they don't actually know. And now the second one gets dropped, and the Baron is almost gone. I don't think they can get there in time. Ghost is popped from Greg. He wants to get in. Don't think so either. Greg gonna run in. Actually, we'll have a chance to try and smite kill this. Greg straight in there, but Lyra secures it in the 50 50. Now, Envy, what are they gonna do? Looking to maybe back out of the way as Fox are looking to fight. Lyra tunnels over the wall. Serve so just as punches out for the gap closing. Envy get away with it. Envy walk right out and not killing off the ward. Unless you're hitting it, it doesn't give any vision. The pink ward disables that. So they drop the second blue orb. Greg does get over there, but not in time. Uh, to really get anything done, he's not able to actually pull off that smite steal. Lyra secures it, and Envy gets the Baron. Yeah, Fox do get the middle lane out of turret. Something. I believe Lyra was a level up, so not a true 50-50 for the yeah. smite fight, but... it's. I mean, it's pretty close, right? Yeah. Like, it's one of those things where... Certainly could have still. <laughs> yeah, he certainly could have. It, it looked like he actually used his smite a little bit early, uh, perhaps anticipating an earlier smite from Lyra. Uh, both junglers obviously trying to utilize uh, their smite in combination with their execute ability. You're going to see Lyra trying to use his E, that ferocious bite, or furious bite rather, for that true damage with his smite, try to combo that and burst it down. And uh, Greg definitely trying to do his own combo with Reckless Smite. Yep. E into smite is the combo for both junglers. Easy one to remember as Lyra ticks the Ocean Drake once again. Hasn't been high octane Drakes really, but maybe will take it as they're looking to siege down some of these lanes. Baron in all three lanes appears to be the plan. Apollo getting top going, couple people in mid, and Seraph, of course, on bot lane duty. Uh, looking to be the target here. They're just trying to push in all sides. They have Baron buff in all three lanes, or at least had it, as Apollo does back off. Uh, the bot lane being shoved in there by Seraph, and he is very, very tanky at this point with the stone play completed. Gonna be hard to actually really put much threat onto him as Looper, so they want to buff up all sides. They want to try to chunk down some of these turrets and really establish a large gold lead uh, before committing to anything crazy. Yep, tier two fourth in the top lane. That's five turrets to three now for Envy. Remember that long lane's kind of causing some pretty significant problems with the Baron pressure. So I'm just able to constantly pressure down the inhib. Mm -hmm. A lot of tankiness as well. Rumble, good items there for Looper, so it can certainly fight effectively both in the 1v1 and in a team fight, but gonna be pinned down here by Seraph and his Baron up minions. Yeah, and the Baron minions, if you actually try to fight, end up adding a lot of damage in, so it can make it a lot more difficult. And be just kind of pressing on both sides. Uh, they have the top lane tier two down. Apollo's gonna be on that inhibitor turret pretty soon, so. Envy's trying to play this game where they try to force multiple members to come one side, then they push on the other side, you back off when they come to your lane, you go forward when they leave your lane. It's basically just a bouncing back and forth, trying to utilize that Baron buff as well as possible. There's a lot of good mobility here across the team, so kind of a nice thing to do when they can bounce between so many waves. But it looks like the base will remain unbroken for Echo Fox. Turret goes down in mid, so not good news there. So yeah. Turret's down, only the inhibited turrets and the Nexus ones left. And they have gotten two outers so far, so it's, it's not bad for the Baron buff. They have picked up quite a bit of gold here already with the Baron uh, kill itself, giving over none of those kills. And look at Lyra just going back and forth through the tunnels over the wall. I mean, low, low tunnel cooldown, that was one of the oh. changes as Keith forced a flash. 
Hathor are just threatening with those hooks and again, kind of the nature of how this is played out. Then we're looking for another siege is that they're actually really far ahead now. I mean, it just kind of feels like last game, to be honest, where Echo Fox is just sitting there and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. It's like, what are you what are you waiting for at this point? I mean, you, eventually you have to choose the engage. And if you let Envy farm your jungle over and over and over and over, if you let them slowly extend the gold lead, uh, there comes the point where you do engage and you're too far behind for it to actually matter. So that is my concern for Echo Fox. Envy, they're the ones getting more, so they don't need to press. Like, they're fine if this game ends with four kills because it means that they're farming all of the jungle, getting more and more of an advantage, where Echo Fox drafted this comp where it's like, oh sweet, you have all this sick engage with Rakan and Kalista, and you're gonna drop the equalizer, you're gonna shockwave, it's gonna be great. And they don't do it, they don't use it. So you're passively just losing the game. Yep, and 8,000 gold ahead is the lead that Envy currently holds. Baron Buff has timed out. So they're gonna have to wait on the next spawn if they do need it. Elder Dragon also the one next up. Again, not huge, massive drakes for Envy, but true damage is always nice if they can grab it. I would like to see Apollo kind of trying on more arrows, though. I mean, at least look for something, like try to get a summoner, because he's 40% CDR, right? Like, he has the Essence Fever plus the crit, and he has a Maw, so uh, he's sitting on 40%. The arrow cooldown is 48 seconds. Like, anytime you can force a, a summoner or even an ultimate from Keith or anything, uh, it's very valuable, and there's so little time where the Ash Arrow is down, that it's, it's really hard for the other team to actually uh, get a punish on that. So, wouldn't mind seeing him at least fish for some arrows, try to look and see if they can get done, anything done. Like, this, this game has just been bizarre to me, like how passive it is. I still don't remember a single, single Weaver's Wall. I still don't remember, like, was there even a single grand entrance from, uh, or heroic entrance from Seraph? Like, I don't know if I remember one. Ultimate, so maybe once in the whole game. Yeah, I mean, in general, it's just been a very slow-paced game. Demonte gets stunned by the arrow. Good target, but protection there from Gate, and no one in range to follow up there for Envy. Yeah, but I don't mind the try. Like I no, said, the cooldown's so low, right? Like, uh, there's going to be 30 seconds or so until Apollo has that arrow back. So it, it's not really much cost. Uh, I do like that they're at least shooting those off, but it's been such an incredibly passive game. Yeah, it, it has, and it's been kind of strange. I can definitely see, the, you know, the, the Game 3 playing more passive than usual. It's kind of something that's systemic, I think, in a lot of close series, and the first two games have been relatively one-sided on either end of the field, so I can see that as well. One thing I will say, you don't see it among the absolute elite teams, among the best teams, right? You need to be able to have the killer instinct. You need to be able to close out games, and. And, and look to force advantages because it, it's simply a world in which you can actually uh, give the team too many chances to get back in. Now, finally for a fight. They're actually going in after the Seraph following in. Big three-man talk coming, gets a bit. A lot of damage on the Keith's gate. Already going to go down. Seraph actually getting the first kill onto the Marksman as Apollo grabs the other member of the duo and Envy. Probably asking themselves why we didn't do that earlier. Yeah, well, I mean, Echo Fox are probably asking the same thing. They finally try to force, but great. You force when you're down over 10,000 gold into a suboptimal situation where Demonte is not even able to get a shockwave off, and, and now the game's over. And it's like they, they didn't even try to, to utilize their composition here. It, it's kind of disappointing to watch. Uh, when Echo Fox did play very well in game one, uh, game two, a, a bit of a disaster. Game three looking kind of like the same, and it just feels like they're playing to not lose instead yeah. of playing to win. And when you play to not lose, you don't give yourself the opportunity to win because you're so passive that you're never actually capitalizing on your on your opponent's mistakes, your opponent's map movements. And that's what I've seen from Echo Fox this game is them sitting back, never actually looking to make a play happen. One last Baron to grab here as Envy should take this one down pretty soon. Niski should be able to wall them off and does do so. Lovely wall. Although cannot get over that one, so no steal coming. Niski himself even grabs the Baron and Envy Gonna reset, go back by, and try and end this one. Nice weaver's wall there from Niski and Envy doing a good job, you know, establishing a huge gold lead. And and here's the play again. Apollo, I believe, caught Demonte with this arrow, so super low CDR. Uh, he already hit him once with it. Hook and arrow, nicely done, uh, forcing out the heal. And then Echo Fox decides we're just gonna go for the engage. Look where Demonte is. How is he supposed to get involved in this fight? Look where Rumble is. Like how how are their solo laners supposed to be involved in this fight? Right, like they're so far away that by the time they arrive, the fight is already decided, so Demonte can not really contribute. Luke, for sure, he throws his equalizer from pretty far away, but that is not a fight that Echo Fox actually has a chance of winning when your soul laners are not getting involved. Well, Elder Dragon down as well, just to make sure Envy have everything they need to try and end this game. I even just saw it on the way ping towards the red buff, so I guess they'll get there on route to top lane. <laughs>
Well, they do have those dragons. They're now cashing on the Elder. Uh, they have an incredible amount of true damage burn here. Uh, with the four stacks, essentially you get one for free for taking that Elder, and then additional 45 damage for every dragon you have after that. Uh, so looking at 180 true damage burn per attack that kind of comes out there, which is an enormous amount. And they are going to be able to have that Baron buff. Two inhibitors already down. Those lanes are going to be auto-pushing, but Lyra is going to kind of usher those minions in and make it happen a little bit faster. You can see Apollo up on the top side prepping that wave. They're establishing vision control in this area, making sure that they can't be flanked. Uh, this is very good textbook play from Envy, uh, who are looking to close out what is a really solid game. Yeah, and should be a lot less uh, frugality, I suppose, with the ultimates. Although, again, another attempt from Fox. Might be too late at this point, oh, but Weaver's they have to wall. wall cuts off three. Not quite in position yet. Seraph blocking around the side. But Lyra, again, just guiding minions in. This is just a great pinter from Envy. Yeah, I mean, Lyra, look, look, look at the wave in the bot side. You don't even have to push. That's uh, a massive amount of minions stacked up down there. Multiple super minions. So all Envy has to do is keep them up here. Keep ushering in these minions. Lyra could even go down and actually buff up that bottom wave. Uh, which is just enormous, and that alone will force them to defend at the Nexus, which means you get a free third inhibitor. So as long as Envy does not fully engage and lose a fight, it's almost an unlosable situation. As the Nexus turrets are already dying. Yep, going to have to respond now, and Envy timing the waves wonderfully. Moving themselves forward, they're even going to go down, buff them up, yep. and start the process. In fact, yeah, that I mean, turret's dead. He's all just chilling out. You sit there, and now the turret goes down up top. They lose the third inhibitor, Echo Fox and not even going to be able to fight uh, for any of these inhibitors, and it's it's a repeat of game two. It's actually great to watch Lyra just babysitting the minions, but Nexus are at one and already down with his health. Now the final stand is going to come, but Seraph tanks every little bit of damage, and Nexus is already dead. Echo Fox just too late on that one, and Envy are going to win the series and sweep the weekend. Yeah, Envy, great weekend for them. A rough game one here, but game two and three are looking extremely dominant. I'm just really disappointed in Echo Fox. I just, it just felt like games two and three, they were not playing to win. They were playing so passively. You have so many forms of engage. You have this explosive AoE comp where you have powerful upfront team fight damage with the Equalizer, with the Orion Ultimate, with the engage from Callista and Rakan, and they never did it. They waited so long to the point where you're almost in an unwinnable position because you're so much down in the goal. Yeah, and it's Almost impossible to say exactly what factors contributed there, but certainly a team is learning a lot as they move through the season. It is still odd that they are making so many changes and adding so many variables late into the season, but clearly a team is trying to find something they've never really had, which is consistency. Yeah, and I mean, credit goes to Envy for also doing a good job for not presenting those opportunities, for being able to you know, absorb the few engages that did come out, for being able to play smart around the map, controlling vision, you know, kind of bleeding their opponents out as they did in games two and three. You know, they choked them out with vision, they controlled the jungle, they farmed it out, they're able to establish enough control to take out these global objectives, the Baron, the Elder, and to look really completely unthreatened, I'd say, in games two and three. And Echo Fox had a very strong game one, but it was off of some big picks and then two extremely early Barons. And it felt like without that really big buffer that they got uh, in the first game, they were really unable to do anything. Yeah, and you can see the two soul leaders there, Apollo and Niski, big smiles on their faces after the victory. A smiley carries that they've added to this team. So clearly, energy's feeling good for Envy. Certainly their record is reflecting uh, the attitude that they're now displaying and a team that's on the up and up. Again, maybe a little narrow as far as how they win games, but it looks very good when they do it. It, cer it certainly can, right? You know, the question is, can they pull this off against, you know, more teams uh, consistently? Can they pull it off against top teams consistently? That's really the question. And there's been so many kind of uh, like surges from these teams. We look at Dignitas this week, coming back looking very strong. Envy coming back this week looking very strong. You know, I think they have uh, a strong interpretation of the meta. They're playing very well around how they want to play. And we'll see if they can actually continue to do that. And for Echo Fox, it's uh, maybe a bit back to the drawing board. You know, you have to, if you want to keep making these subs happen, you have to have the players all on the same page, all confident to execute your compositions. Because if you're playing a hardcore engaged AoE composition and you're not utilizing it, then you're not really playing to the strengths that you've drafted. I have to imagine the Echo Fox drawing world's pretty intense because there is a lot going on. And you know what I would drop there? Well. I would drop Froggen's face and I would put him <laughs> back in because they didn't use him in either of their losses this That's weekend. That's true. Frog and Wet may be the call from the Echo Fox fans because it is puzzling in a lot of ways to see why he's not playing. But, hey, 
Envy will take it. Three games, yeah. but still a win. And I will say, on the other side, Danny Midland is playing very well. Yeah, Niski is playing very well. I think, uh, you know, him and Pyrian have been working pretty well together. Uh, people kind of talked about, oh, well, they have such different champion pools. Well, it's Niski on Talia. That, yeah. was, that was Pyrian's thing. So, you know, is this going to stay as a true sub situation? My feeling is no. I'm guessing that it's just, you know, kind of trying out Niski, and now uh, he has been very successful. So we'll see if they stick with him. But. You know, it's certainly not all the blame on DeMonte, so I don't want people to put it there. This is a, a team effort and, and a team loss. Certainly is and always will be, but for a first-hand account on that series, let's hear from Riff and Envy's bot laner. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Great cast on the day. I am joined by Apollo after their victory over Echo Fox, jumping over them very well in this victory. A two to one. It did go all three games, kind of pushed back and forth. You said, I'm going to let you talk to that first thing you were just telling me, is it was pretty fun because we kind of realized we weren't doing anything, and then first blood happened. Yeah. No, I, I didn't even realize it was like, I think it was like 20 minutes in the game or something like that, and we had first blood, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess I got the extra bonus goal. You know, it's nice. But yeah, we didn't really do that much, and even the ending was like, kind of boring. It was like, okay, we're not fighting, and then we're not fighting, and then we just ended the game. So, But the other two games were exciting, and, you know, a lot of a lot of kills. <laughs> well, it's got to feel pretty good knowing you can push that advantage to a win. Sometimes it stalls out, and then you get the long games. It becomes difficult. However, Envy's got to be feeling pretty good. A Cloud9 victory this week, another victory for you guys. Kind of what's the overall feeling of the team right now? How are you guys right in the middle of the playoff pack? I think a little bit surprised because... <laughs> We didn't really, I mean, it's not like we weren't confident, but we, uh, it was definitely a rough set of scrim or like two weeks of scrims that we had. So I wasn't like, I was a little bit nervous about C9. They, they were pretty strong, even though they didn't do as well in Rift Rivals. I think, you know, they're still a really strong team. So, uh, I'm glad we 2 0 them. And then, yeah, I mean, Echo Fox are also a strong team. They kind of gave us a, a couple of sub rosters, so maybe helped a little bit but <laughs> uh yeah no i mean i'm, I'm really happy that we you know, pulled the 2-0 especially because this is like a really big turning point because you know we're fighting for playoffs now rather than fighting to stay out of relegations <laughs> and yeah it's good it's good right on. Right on. sorry about that yeah. uh two-parter here kind of you talked about sub rosters a little bit you guys yourself using Pyrian and niski in the mid lane how is that adapting and then i'm going to ask you ask ask you what's it like playing against the 10-man roster so first what's it like adapting with Pyrian and niski uh, it's good. There's a lot of the thing is they're actually pretty similar in skill level. Uh, I think they're you know they're both really strong players, so it's not like a clear choice that we've had, uh, obviously. And yeah, I think they have they both their you know strengths and weaknesses, and I think it's really neat that we can kind of choose between the two. Uh, yeah, and I think they're both really great players, and they have a lot of potential. And how do you prepare for the ten man roster? You kind of just play your own game because it's the champions are going to have the same skills. It's really can you outplay the other guy? Yeah, so there in this case, I think there are some situations where like, oh, we don't have to ban this because you know this player doesn't play that, and so it does kind of make you think more. Um, but in the end, like you said, it's just you play your champions, you just gotta outplay them anyways, and it's it's sometimes annoying, but most of the time it just doesn't really matter for me. <laughs> All right, Apollo, final question. You guys are in a great spot to make a run for that first position to be in the top playoff spots. What are you guys kind of working on right now? What are you gunning for? Are there things you need to kind of fix first, or are you guys actually pushing for that top spot? Uh... We're, you know, we're working for playoffs, I think. We're not going for the top spot. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, playoffs. And I think just in terms of improving, a lot of it has to do with our picks and bands, I think. Because... Uh, yeah, I think I think picks and bans is a huge problem that, with ours because like on purple side we lose a lot. And I think it just has to do with our pick and ban. But other than that, mainly just on stage performance. I think we perform generally better on, in scrims. Uh, this week is excluded in that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I think those are the two main things: like pick and ban, and like just you know being more confident and like aggressive on stage. Awesome. Well, it seems to be happening in the plays. Another victory for you guys in a 2-0 week to start things off to go for that run. Now we're going to throw it to the analyst desk to break down the rest of the day. Thank you very much, Riv. Envy with the victory here in 2-1 fashion over Echo Fox to push themselves to 7-5. and And I think Apollo keyed in on something very important here. Again, that developing playoff picture. We've got two-game separation between them and Dignitas versus the top three teams in CLG, Immortals, and TSM. Now with Cloud9 slotting in as the sixth team currently. And then there's a fair number of separation between them and the other four. So mm -hmm. they've positioned themselves very well now with this 2-0 weekend here, looking at these final three weeks of LCS play. Right. I mean, they're still going to have to play a couple good teams, but you're you're expecting, you know, if you go 500 from here on out, you can basically project yourself to make playoffs. Exactly. Potentially even lose a little bit. So uh, in this sense, they've set themselves up tremendously well this weekend for their chances of actually getting to play a little bit more into the playoffs. And then if they do well there, gone 
gauntlet run. Now, within this game, we saw Echo Fox return to the roster that they had in game one that they were successful with. And of course, with that came a little bit, again, of a switch up in Champions Select, just in terms of, you know, what they prioritize with that set of five specifically. But also very interesting to hear from Apollo, you know, how do you deal with that as a team? We had those questions going into each next game of the series is what is Envy doing in this five minutes, 10 minutes that they have to readjust based on the roster they've been given from Echo Fox? And, and yeah, you heard him say that it, it can be tough sometimes. You don't really know if the pick band that you're preparing in, in the downtime between games is going to hold up when you find out, oh, there's three <laughs> other random dudes sitting over there now. Like, like we have to throw everything out the window. Right. Uh, and I think what, what you heard him say was uh, you're just going to have to do your best. You throw uh, more general bands like Zach, Kate, Elise. If you look at those first three bands, all OP, you know, champions, right. standard bands. And then you draft your champions and you play your style to the best of your ability. There's something to be said for preparation, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to beat these players, mm -hmm. right? It, 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 if you want to be the best team in North America, then it doesn't matter which version of Echo Fox comes out onto the rift. You've got to be able to beat them. Same with TSM if they were running subs. Same with C9 with Ray or Impact. In all these situations, you need to prove that regardless of who gets swapped in, we have the tools from a player standpoint to beat you. And I think you can see that this game, that was most of the case uh, from the minute, from the, basically the first minute, Envy controlled the entire game. It was not an explosive game. They right. didn't dominate them, but they kind of ground them out. They got small leads. They took objectives. They made, made a top dive onto Looper. They got that kill. They started taking turrets. And it, you see, it, it did take a little bit of a time to get rolling. Yes. But they were grabbing objectives during that time. They were stealing red buffs away. And then finally, when they got that first kill, it, it started that kind of downhill trend. Well, and that is the, the picture of control. As you mentioned, you use that word control. And I love that word here because as the almost the entirety of that gold graph is the color red, it showcases that at every moment in the game, even if the gold lead wasn't necessarily spiking a little bit more, they weren't conceding many advantages, if at all. And then once those Baron buffs start coming through once again we see envy's ability now as a team to group up as five and push objectives something that was lacking in their spring split play and i will say that first baron buff that they got was a little suspect because it ended up in a 50 50 situation 10 men alive on the rift no one dead no man advantage as you make this rare play. That, and, that happens and both junglers in the pick going for the smite so it was definitely not a controlled situation that we're kind of used to seeing when it's Pyrian with talia on yes. envy uh, so, so that part was, uh, you know, there's still obvious signs of improvement for what MB, uh, Envy needs to work on here. But like you said, once they got that Baron buff, the game, uh, the, the lead ballooned exponentially. Very much so. Player of the game going to Apollo, who we had got to speak to just a moment ago, landing a lot of clutch arrows. Uh, I mean, again, he has been vocal this split in particular about his veteran status. Now, he's been a veteran for a fairly long period of time, but he's been critical of himself and saying that in the past, I have fallen short as a veteran, where I needed to be a leader, where I needed to step up and make plays and be the, you know, the, the louder voice on the team and direct my younger guys. He's, I think he's filling that role out a bit better now. Yeah, anyone who's been playing competitively since about season two is going to have a lot of experience, and he's had this transformation a little bit, this split in particular, where it's not just about... I know what I need to do to, to get out to get my own, you know, make sure I don't die and do these things. But how can I actually snowball with my team? And what what does my team need out of me so I can push my lead the furthest? Absolutely. Well, that's going to do it for our final game of the day. So with that game in the books, let's go ahead and take a look at which players really shined in our week of games. Bjergsen, Alltech, and Poe Belter each stepped up for their respective teams by picking up two POGs each, while Adrian, Ray, and Demonte all picked up their first honors in week six. Of course, these guys kind of showing up for the first time here. Yeah. Now, in the wake of his big week, Bjergsen has pulled ahead in the standings with seven accolades to his name, followed by the likes of Dardock, Sneaky, and Lyra with six POGs each. Is anything here shock you on the POGs list? Is there anyone who's not there that you expect to be there or anyone who is there that you are actually surprised is? I would have to say Dardock uh, kind of being amongst the top. When you think about CLG this season, you're, you're thinking Darshan and you're thinking Huhi, but the guy on CLG with the most is actually Dardock. Yeah. And, and he's starting to split time now even. So it is a little surprising. He hasn't been awful this split, so it's not like, oh my God, how did he get these? He, right. he has had good games, but uh, it, he does feel like almost fourth fiddle, but behind, you know, you include Afro on that list. It speaks to the volatility of the player, right? right? Again, when he goes off, when he has a big performance, it's very clear that he is the catalyst for victory. On the flip side, he can be a detriment at times, or it just, you know, is done by somebody else, and he's playing that more supportive role. Again, as you mentioned, now splitting time with Omar God as well, it makes it even more impressive that he is still so high up on that list. Now let's go ahead and take a look at how the teams ended their weekend. First place, 
all tied up between TSM, Immortals, and Counter-Logic Gaming, while Team Dignitas and Team Envy end their weekend in fourth, leaving Cloud9 in sixth place. Kind of surprised to be saying that after uh, you know their spring split finish and even going to Rift Rivals and whatnot. We'll be back again next week, though, with more LCS action. Friday kicks off with Cloud9 versus Phoenix One. We'll see which of those two teams comes out on top, followed by Lorlo and Team Liquid facing Seraph and Team Envy. Now, you took to Twitter this weekend to call out the plays that made your jaw drop, and here are a few of the ones we wanted to share, brought to you by Acer. First up, Ancient Relic pointed out the beautiful Gnar ult from Hanser in his series versus P1. Take a look. This man may be caught here, though. Looking to fight. It's caught, a special aim, but good buff for them. Double gets him out now. The hook landing back in onto Zeke. It's going to get a dive into the team. No, oh, oh, my God! God. Oh, 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 now Bjorkson takes down Zeke. TSM, get a wipe the floor. Yeah, they're going, they're going, they're going. I'm going to push, I'm going to push. Bro, bro, bro. J4, 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 bro. Don't close, don't close, don't close. I'm a J4, I'm a J4. Close, 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 close. I'm a close, I'm a close. Kogi, Kogi. Kogi, we win, we win, we win. Looked like a four man ult. All five people were there, but somebody went down yeah. right after that. So, but I mean, very impressive ult from him. That fight in and of itself was crazy explosive, at least in the context of that game as well. Right, and I, I like the calmness in the sense that you heard, like they had a single target that they wanted to focus down. It wasn't like, oh my God, huge ult. It was Kalista, Kalista, Kalista the whole way through. Even though you're hitting a huge multi-man ultimate, keep calm and focus on your next objective. Yeah, Hanser, I mean, he's always been a top performer in NA, in his lane. The, the, the likes of a NAR pick bodes very well for him because it gives him so much control and so many options in how he wants to play the game. Up next, Hollywood Decline couldn't resist the rhyme before Quadra High, after Quadra Bye. Let's see this one. Moon had to go out there. He only has 30% HP. Moon's incredibly, incredibly low. They're actually going to go for the fight. Oh, Golden Glow almost goes down immediately. He drops. The Elder Drake goes down. It's grabbed by Anori. A huge pickup if they can take down FlyQuest, stopping them from getting the Triple Drake. High is going to be the next to go down. Piglet. Piglet's on the outside with Anori. It's enough of a tank to let Piglet get away. But what can FlyQuest get out of this? I'm hitting, uh, I'm hitting, I'm hitting. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. Stick on her. Talk about the difference between those two uh, comms. We were saying how nice it was to hear their single focus out of TSM. There you see FlyQuest all over the place. A little bit more disjointed, but uh, you can hear High's voice coming through on the backside of that, calling out which targets are going down and who to focus next. But at the end of the day, performance on Orianna in those late game team fights, it's so crucial that you're hitting your spells. He did it there, wins them the game. That's all you can ask. Finally, Double if showed some A-tier ADC chops in his 2v1 at the end of a fight just today. Let's take another look. Trying to get away, but it's a double kill for Piglet. Likely wanting to make it a triple, except he's not even the, the one crits. responsible. Double if with the outplay! Jumping away oh! from that! Dodges the Justice Punch! And they die together! I mean, I could watch that multiple times. We heard him talk in his interview about how he doesn't feel he's stacking up in the laning phase still and has work to do there, and that might qu quite possibly be true. But there is something to be said for the way that he executes around team fights. I mean, he just has this sense for where the threat is coming from. Even before that moment, there was he was dodging out on Gragas barrels that were coming in on the ground. He, he has this uh, unnatural ability to just avoid skill shots mm -hmm. in very cluttered situations. Well, there you have it. Great performance out of him. Now, don't forget to tweet your big plays all weekend long and we won't forget to share them at the end of the weekend for future weeks, of course. Now for myself, the casters, and the entire live broadcast crew, thank you for watching, and make sure to stick around for the show where Jap, myself, and Kobe will be wrapping up the week on NALCS tonight. Otherwise, we'll see you next week for more North American LCS. Good night.